We're going to wrap up our very brief visit to the world of neuroscience with a, a look at what might appear to be something taken straight from the annals of science fiction, a brain-computer interfaces. On the slide on the left, you see what people are probably thinking of when they think of a brain-computer interface. They're probably thinking all kinds of woo things. On the right, the uh, sad reality is portrayed somewhat more realistically. Let's step through this. First of all, why would you want a brain-computer interface? Well, to interface with your computer. What is a brain-computer interface? Your fingers. You have a perfectly good brain-computer interface. It's your hands and your eyes. That's how you interact with a computer, which is a kind of a machine. There's no magic psychic power that can your brain can hook up with a computer. Your brain-computer interface is the same as your brain, as your brain toaster interface. It's your hands and your eyes. But there are reasons, nonetheless, why one might want to consider some kind of direct, uh, not direct, and it's really indirect, some kind of alternative route from the brain to some kind of computational machine. The principal motivation here is for people who are paralyzed. There are plenty of neurodegenerative diseases that can take years and years and years and years and years and providing some means for people who do not have the use of their hands to communicate is extremely important. That is the principal area of application. In the peripheral nervous system, that is the nerves, the spinal column, and the nerves that go down to the arms and the legs, there's um, the potential to develop means for rehabilitation, for bridging gaps, for creating prostheses that are controlled by the user themselves without using their hands. So there are opportunities here in rehabilitation, especially with regard to mobility and developing neuroprosthetics. Way, way, way down the list, and we visit the, the, this briefly, there are, some people see opportunities here for um, use in the entertainment industry. We'll talk about that very briefly. And as usual, the military is always keeping its eye on this kind of thing and is funding the research. I strongly hope they get nothing out of it, but there you go. So, what are we talking about for the more rational applications? Well, um, if, you can, if you can record directly from the cortical surface, which is not what you do with EEG, remember. With EEG, you record from the scalp. But if you were to open up the head, take off the scalp, take off the bone, saw through the bone, take off the connective tissue, get rid of the fluid, and put your electrode directly on the brain, you would record a much clearer signal. There was something much more pristine. I still, Again, it's hard to interpret as a signal. But you could do a recording and you could translate that, for example, into commands for powering a wheelchair or possibly into movement controls for a, an artificial arm. The idea here is that you encourage people to learn to signal their intention. That is their desire to turn one way or another or to move in one direction or another. So fairly simple intentions, right? Um, both the, the situations we're, we're considering here um, bypass the usual route, which is through the peripheral nerves and muscles to the hands or the legs. Um, and the end goal is to provide communication and control to people who are very, very paralyzed. So here's an example of the way a system like this works if you were trying, for example, to communicate with it. Somebody with a severe neurodegenerative disease is completely paralyzed and wants to write a letter. And this is one of the first applications. Imagine you're staring at the clunky interface on the screen there. And you want to write a letter. You've already written, dear mom, how are we going to write the next letter? A dot appears from the left of the screen and slowly tracks to the right. And then you can learn to intentionally steer that dot up or down as it passes so that you hit, like a target, one of the four boxes over on the right. That picks out one third of the alphabet, second third of the alphabet, third third of the alphabet, or a backspace. 
Then the display changes and the dot reappears on the left and tracks in slowly. And now you're going to select within that three, the third of the alphabet, you're going to select among groups of three letters. And then the dot's going to appear from the left and track slowly over. And now you're going to aim for a specific letter, in this case, G, H, or I. And when you get there, congratulations, you typed one letter. How slow do you think that is? It is impossibly slow. This is not some pipe dream of fast, rapid, instantaneous communication using the full bandwidth power of some kind of imaginary brain. This is slow, laborious, but if it's all you have available to you, it's fantastic. The very first letter written in this way was nothing but an expression of heartfelt thanks for developing the technology. When we say that you're controlling the dot in this instance, what we mean is you can learn to exhibit a very, to make a small difference, very small difference to whatever signal we're recording from the cortex. And of course, if someone is paralyzed like this, there's justification for recording directly from the cortex, right? But basically the discrimination we're making is one bit, up or down. It's like having a single lever on a video game controller which you can push forward or can push back. And you aim, and from a reading of the uh, cortical electrodes, you can influence what's going on in your brain to some extent in order to make this tiny little bit of a difference. It doesn't mean you're introspecting about your brain or you know what the hell you're doing. It's more like learning to exercise a very limited sort of will. So this is still an infant science. It would be much better if there were non-invasive techniques that didn't require sawing open the skull and placing electrodes directly on the cortex. And perhaps the biggest drawback is that people's imagination runs away with them. Through a misunderstanding of what brains are, an ignorance of the challenges which are come with studying brains, and a desire for the fantastic and the wonderful, people imagine all sorts of things here that are not really possible. And as usual, when neuro is involved, there's marketers not far behind. There are commercial products that claim to offer brain-computer in interfaces. These typically have one, two, or three electrodes which sit on the forehead. And you can try and use the power, magic power of your brain to control something on the screen. I've had my students examine one of these and we tried it out and it was a great feeling at first. They had a cube spinning on a video screen and you could reverse the direction of the cube. You could actually influence what was going on through the power, well, it seemed, of your will. But what was actually happening? Well, to try, you were trying very hard. So when you try, you furrow your brow like this. And the electrodes were picking up muscle signals. They had nothing to do with brain signals whatsoever. So it's easy to fool people again. I hope we've done enough to illustrate both the enormous potential but also the challenges and the difficulties of neuroscience. We're trying simultaneously to figure out what the brain does and how it does it. We do not yet have a fully agreed conceptual grasp of what the brain does, so we don't know the stance we should take as we approach it. Where, we're, where, where ignorance is so plentiful, it's much more satisfying to have convergent evidence from different kinds of studies. So we've seen animal studies, pathology studies, we've seen um, various kinds of neuroimaging techniques that can be all put together. Then there's modeling and there's behavioral experiments and all of these can be combined in order to begin to develop a more substantial account of the brain and its role in our lives. Lurking in the background is always the leap to simple solutions and always the, the danger of imposing your view of what a person is onto an innocent organ of the body. Phrenology made this mistake, and it made it so clear that we really shouldn't repeat it, but the presence of so many technologies that deliver signals or results that are very, very hard to interpret means we have a tendency to slip down that direction again. Over-localization of function, being too strong in your statements that one part of the brain does X, Y, or Z, is a danger that's constantly lurking in the background, and we oughtn't to repeat that mistake.